So let us pray together. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word. Reveal to us the good news and enable us to trust in your promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Lent this year began on Ash Wednesday, which was also Valentine's Day, if you remember. And we spent the time this year using our imaginations, wandering or wondering, in the wilderness and following Jesus on the way of love. And somebody was asking me about our altar earlier. Uh, we had this beautiful wilderness display down the bottom here with the red flower standing for the, for the love, for the way of love that we are on. We've got gorgeous flowers on the altar too this morning. We've been reminded that sometimes new life cannot come until we let go and enter into the darkness. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it will not bear fruit, as we heard last week. And we've seen that the light illuminating the darkness, and we've been invited to step into that light and be lights for the world. John 3, 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But today the shadows loom. After the excitement of the palm procession, we're in the shadow of the cross. Artists often paint in the early morning or late, late afternoon because shadows add depth to paintings. It's only when the sun's directly overhead that there's no shadows. For most of the day there are some shadows. And the same is true of our lives. The good and the bad get mixed together. The shadows become longer at certain times. So today we're going to walk towards the cross and you can do your own wondering as we listen to the passion story, as the gospel writer Mark tells it. We're going to split it into two sections. We're going to hear Mark 14, which starts a couple of days before the Passover and ends on the eve of the Passover. And then I'm going to give a few words of reflection before we hear Mark 15 which tells about the events on the day of Jesus' crucifixion. So let's start with Mark 14. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were two days away. The Jewish leaders, the chief priests and the scribes gathered to discuss how they might secretly arrest Jesus and kill him. It was after this that Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to meet the chief priests with the intention of betraying Jesus to them. When they heard what he proposed, they were delighted and promised him money. So from that time on, Judas thought and waited and sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the evening of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the customary day when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus and the twelve arrived and went into the upper room, and each reclined around the table, leaning upon an elbow as he ate. I tell you in absolute sincerity, one of you eating with me tonight is going to betray me it is one of you, the twelve, one of you who has dipped your bread in the same dish that I am. The Son of Man goes to his fate. That has already been predicted in the scriptures. But still, it will be terrible for the one who betrays him. It would have been better for him if he had never been born. As they ate, Jesus took bread, offered a blessing, and broke it. He handed the pieces to his disciples. He took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks for it, he passed it to them, and they all drank from it. After the meal, they sang a psalm, and went out of the city to the Mount of Olives. All of you will desert me tonight. It was written by Zechariah. 
I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. But when I am raised up, I will go ahead of you to the altar. Peter protested. It doesn't matter who else turns his back on you. I will never desert you. Peter, mark my words. This very night before the cock crows twice, you will have denied me three times. Peter insisted. No, teacher. Even if it means that I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. All of the other disciples said similar things. They came at length to a garden called Gethsemane. Stay here. I'm going a little farther to pray and to think. He walked on a little further. Then he threw himself on the ground and prayed for deliverance from what was about to come. He got up went back to the three, and found them sleeping. <clears throat> well, that's enough sleep. The time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, man, and let's go. The one who is going to betray me is close by. Before he had finished talking, Judas, one of the twelve, approached with a large group of people, agents of the chief priests, scribes, and elders in Jerusalem, armed with swords and clubs. The signal they had arranged was a kiss. Watch to see whom, he, whom I kiss. He's the one, Judas had told them. Arrest him and take him into secure custody. As soon as they arrived, Judas stepped forward, kissed Jesus, and said, My teacher. Immediately the soldiers grabbed Jesus and took him into custody. When they saw the armed crowd take Jesus into custody, the disciples fled. They led Jesus off to see the high priest, who had gathered a council of religious and civic leaders, scribes, chief priests, and elders, to hear the evidence and render some decision regarding Jesus. Peter followed at a safe distance all the way into the courtyard of the high priests and sat down with the guards to warm himself at their fire. He hoped no one would notice. The verdict was unanimous. Jesus was guilty of a capital crime. While Peter was waiting by the fire outside, one of the servant girls of the high priest saw him and said to him, You are one of those men with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter said, Woman, I do not know what you're talking about. <laughs> he left the fire, and as he went out into the gateway, a cock crowed. The servant girl saw him again, saying, Hey, this is one of them. One of those who followed Jesus. Peter denied it again. No, I am not one of them. A little later, some of the other bystanders turned to Peter, accusing him, Surely you're one of them. You're a Galilean. We can tell by your accent. But Peter cursed and swore. Listen, I don't even know the man you're talking about. And as he said this, a cock crowed a second time. Peter remembered what Jesus had told him. Before the cock crows twice, you will have denied me three times. He began to weep. So do any of you have a giant foam finger? You know, the ones that are often waved at sports games. They've usually got the number one on them. Fans wave them in the air to say, we're number one. And it's just a short move to turn those fingers on their side and point them at one another and say, we're out to get you. 
It's what happened with the crowds on Palm Sunday. They waved their palm leaves and hands and fingers in support and celebration. And a few days later, they were pointing the finger and cheering for Barabbas. I think Peter is my favorite disciple with his impetuousness and eagerness. Here he is again promising Jesus that he won't desert him. And just a few hours later, he denies Jesus three times. We've gone from fingers in the air to fingers that are hidden. Each year I read this scripture and God gives me a fresh and different perspective on it. This time it was Judas and his actions that caught my attention. Judas Iscariot was one of the twelve disciples. There's no specific stories in the Gospels that mention Judas except this one. And Mark told us that he was the one who held the common purse. So up to this point, Judas was a well-loved and trusted disciple. And then Judas goes to the chief priests and tells them that he can lead them to Jesus. And they offer him money to do that. And he follows through on it. I wonder why the chief priests needed Jesus pointed out. Because they know who he is. But Jesus is staying in an upstairs guest room in Jerusalem, and I assume that that location was kept deliberately secret. And that the religious authorities had lost track of where Jesus was. They were concerned about his teachings, and the claims that he was making, that he was the anointed one, the Messiah. Judas like the other disciples, was originally expecting the Messiah to come as a king, to overthrow the Romans. Things were looking bad for Jesus. Did Judas think that by handing him over to the high priest and having a showdown would give Jesus the opportunity to reveal his divine power and inaugurate his kingdom? Was he surprised by the way that events played out after Jesus' arrest? Or were Jesus' actions traitorous, a betrayal? When Jesus said, one of you will betray me, and they all denied they would, was, Jesus, was Judas's a response, a lie on his part? Or did he truly think that he was doing what he was called to do? Judas followed Jesus as far as his strength and insight would take him, and then he fell short. Were his actions deliberate, or were they misguided? I don't know. Does the reason matter? Judas was the type of person that Jesus came to save. Jesus came and he mixed with the outcasts, the lepers, the hungry, the prisoner, the sinner. And Jesus taught us to forgive, not once or twice but 70 times 7 and more besides, and to love our enemies. Jesus went to the cross for us to show us a better way to live, to offer us forgiveness, to put us in a right relationship with God. But ever since Judas betrayed Jesus, Christians have pointed fingers at Judas. Traitor, traitor, traitor and made jokes at the expense of Jesus. We say things like, don't be a Judas. Peter denied Jesus three times before the cockerel crowed twice. But Peter had the opportunity to meet with Jesus again after the resurrection. He was forgiven and given a chance to start afresh. And what happened to Judas? Well, the Gospel writer Matthew tells us that Judas felt so bad about what he had done and what people were saying that he hanged himself. Judas took his old life. And as I pondered this, I wondered who the bullied and humiliated Judases are among us right now. Who needs to hear some good news? 
Social media today can amplify our mistakes. Public shaming is a terrible thing. I googled for examples of suicides due to bullying and pages and pages came up and so many of them were teenagers. God didn't ask us to be judge and jury. He called us to walk on the way of love and offer grace and forgiveness to others. And sometimes it's us that's Judas, following Jesus as far as our strength and our insight will take us, and then we fall short in a shame-filled way too. But that grace, that forgiveness is there for us too. It's there for each one of us. Jesus even said to those who were crucifying him, crucifying him, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. After the resurrection, Jesus was forgiven. If Judas had been able to hang on for longer, then I'm sure that he too would have received Christ's forgiveness. So together, we have the power to protect the most vulnerable. The power to turn our finger pointing from we're out to get you to something positive, to we love you. We can show others the way of love. We can be the light that shines in the shadows, speaking up and not denying our relationship to Jesus, God's anointed, the liberating son, the son of the blessed one. Let's do that. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray together. When we, when we hate or are unkind to one another, the world becomes a darker place. Jesus taught us to love each other. When we scare or bully others, the world becomes a darker place. Jesus taught us that love is better than fear. When we want to hurt those who mistreat us, the world becomes a darker place. Jesus taught us to bless those who persecute us. In the darkness, Jesus said, O oh God, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Amen.